Many people are unaware of the fact that Bitcoin didn't just come out of the blue by a random guy on some mailing list. The truth is that it's been in development for decades before Satoshi first sent his white paper to a controversial group of troublemakers called the cypherpunks. It just wasn't called Bitcoin at the time. I'll explain. Today we talk about important events and people that preceded Bitcoin and how they fought for the protection of privacy in an increasingly exposed world of the internet. Hi, Ante here. We can probably agree that no man can single-handedly create something as complex as Bitcoin in just one lifetime. And that's because it was a result of decades of hard work by many computer scientists and cryptographers, which can be traced back all the way to the 70s. Before the 70s came around, strong encryption was considered to be a military munition and therefore illegal to export from the US. In fact, it was mostly practiced in secret by military and spy agencies. But that changed after the publishing of two things. 1975 data encryption standard by the US government, which is a symmetric block cipher that was once used by the US government as a standard when it comes to sensitive data encryption. And the other is the scientific paper by Dr. Whitfield Diffie and Dr. Martin Hellman from 1976 called New Directions in Cryptography. That opened the world of cryptography to general public and research papers and different projects started sprouting all over the place. Here are some of them. If you recognize any of the keywords from this list, such as public key, asymmetric encryption algorithm, or blockchain, no wonder as Bitcoin uses all of these as foundations on which it operates. But I'll come back to that in a sec. As the internet evolved, ever more people were becoming concerned about their personal information, even though privacy, corporate control of information, and similar issues only became a widespread subject around the year 2000. The fight for privacy eventually resulted in a movement that began in late 1992, when Eric Hughes, Timothy C. May, and John Gilmore formed a group that held meetings each month at John Gilmore's company Cygnus Solutions in the San Francisco Bay Area. What they were doing was advocating widespread use of strong cryptography and privacy-enhancing technologies as a route to social and political change. At the very beginning of their movement, Jude Millen, or Saint Jude as she's called, described the group as the cypherpunks, which combined the terms cypher, which means to encrypt something, and cyberpunk, which is a genre of fiction made popular by sci-fi writers. Other than on the meetings themselves, they conducted their communication through a mailing list they put together, which is to this day referred to as the cypherpunks mailing list, to which Bitcoin's creator Satoshi Nakamoto later sent his Bitcoin white paper. And that's how the cypherpunk story began. Soon after forming, Eric Hughes releases a cypherpunk's manifesto, which contained their basic ideas. And reading it is the best way to understand what drove them in their mission. Here's an excerpt. Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Privacy is not secrecy. A private matter is something one doesn't want the whole world to know, but a secret matter is something one doesn't want anybody to know. Privacy is the power to selectively reveal oneself to the world. Privacy in an open society also requires cryptography. If I say something, I want it heard only by those for whom I intend it. If the content of my speech is available to the world, I have no privacy. We must defend our own privacy if we expect to have any. We must come together and create systems which allow anonymous transactions to take place. We, the cypherpunks, are dedicated to building anonymous systems. We are defending our privacy with cryptography, with anonymous mail forwarding systems, with digital signatures, and with electronic money. We can easily agree that their main drivers were privacy and trustless systems, and they were determined to fight for it with all means necessary. Don't trust, verify. And here is where Bitcoin's role starts. The very last thing in this excerpt is electronic money. Up until Bitcoin came to be, all transactions had to go through an intermediary of some sort, be it a bank, PayPal or something else. What Bitcoin provides is a pure P2P system where users can transact among themselves without any need of a third party. And what they can transact with is something non-government issued, but is minted in form of a coin from the system itself through mining and not just from thin air. Satoshi explained it himself in the first ever email he sent to the P2P foundation. The root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. 
Banks must be trusted to hold our money and transfer it electronically, but they lend it out in waves of credit bubbles with barely a fraction in reserve. With today's global monetary policy, where over a third of all US dollars in existence were printed over the course of a single year, he's even more right than he was 13 plus years ago. However, just because the cypherpunk needed electronic money, that doesn't mean it just fell down from the sky. Only 17 years after the official forming of the cypherpunks had Bitcoin been invented. In the meantime, and even before the cypherpunks, many cryptographers have tried out their own ideas on how a digital currency should work, only to realize they must be missing something. Here's the rest of the list. So what are Bitcoin's foundations? Let's see what gave rise to Bitcoin throughout the years. These are some of the people who helped the field of cryptography immensely with their efforts, and in the following chapter we'll cover them as well as their contributions. You may think of Satoshi as the first chef who got all the ingredients just right for the dish. What I mean by that is that all of Bitcoin's underlying technologies had already been invented when he came forward with his white paper. The first and the most obvious example is blockchain. Even though it's considered cutting edge and disruptive nowadays, there's nothing new about blockchain at all. The first proposal of the term blockchain that we know of comes from David Chalm's 1982 dissertation called Computer Systems Established, Maintained and Trusted by Mutually Suspicious Groups. Historically speaking, Bitcoin is not even the longest running blockchain chronologically. That award goes to New York Times, which has been publishing an up-to-date hash value in an ad section every single week since 1995, making it almost 14 years older than Bitcoin's blockchain. Why they used hashing is to ensure the integrity of each issue of the paper, by giving it a unique signature, something resembling a fingerprint that is cryptographically linked to the previous issue. If you're interested in what exactly blockchain is and what ties all the blocks into a cryptographic chain, check out my first ever video right up there. Now we'll go back to 1989, the year of the first real attempt at creating a digital currency, which was called Digicash. It was founded by the very same person that published the aforementioned dissertation, David Chom. His idea was that all transactions should be anonymous and that digital currency shouldn't be issued by any government or financial institution. In order to work, the system required software that would encrypt transactions by designating encrypted keys to banknotes before sending them to the recipient, making it untraceable by a third party. Eventually, Digicash filed for bankruptcy nine years later in 1998 after failing to grow successfully through the expansion of its user base. But David's advancements in the field of cryptography, such as blind signatures and public and private key technology, certainly paved the way for other digital currencies to come. In fact, the ideas explained in his dissertation have been described as the technical roots of the vision of the entire cypherpunk movement. We now move on to Hashcash. Blockchain is obviously not the only technology Bitcoin uses. The next technology in line is proof of work, first introduced properly by Adam Back in a proof of work system called Hashcash, which was a system used to limit email spam and denial of service or DOS attacks. The concept of proof of work was invented in 1992 paper by Cynthia Dwork and Moni Naor called Pricing via Processing or Combating Junk Mail. And the term itself was first formalized in a 1999 paper by Marcus Jacobson and Ari Jules. Just so I don't take too much of your time, what it all boils down to with proof of work is the introduction of a function that is moderately hard to solve, but its solution or proof is easily verified. I'll explain. If you're wondering why would someone even introduce such a system to email, it's because of increasingly overwhelming amount of spam mail back in the day. The spammer could basically send out thousands of emails, which is, as you can probably imagine, extremely annoying. So to battle spam, you have to make sending emails complicated enough for spammers while keeping it simple enough for all the rest. And how do you do that? By introducing a task that requires a certain amount of work, time, energy or what have you, which would not be too intense for regular users because it would only take a second to execute it, but in case of a spam it would add up to something significant enough to disincentivize them from doing so in the first place. Hal Finney, the earliest Bitcoin adopter and supporter and the second person ever to mine Bitcoin right after Satoshi, later invented reusable proof of work, or RPOW 
which was intended as a prototype for a digital cash system based on Nick Szabo's theory of collectibles. He had the idea that a system using RPOW would need a token whose value would be guaranteed by the real-life resources required to mint the tokens in the first place, such as electricity. The concept of securing digital money by means of a token was later adopted by Satoshi in Bitcoin Protocol using the SHA-256 algorithm. We mentioned Nick Szabo here, but before we touch on that, let's go over to Wei Dai and his project first. Wei Dai is a computer engineer and graduate of the University of Washington, whose project B-Money was revealed in his 1998 paper as an anonymous distributed electronic cash system. He described it as an untraceable network, where senders and receivers are identified only by digital pseudonyms, that is, public keys, and each message is signed by its sender and encrypted to its receiver. But other than public and private keys and digital signatures, he proposed that collective bookkeeping would be necessary, with cryptographic protocols helping to authenticate transactions. This was also later adopted by Bitcoin in the form of miners and proof of work. However, B-Money was never really launched, so it remained only a proposal and a concept. Interestingly enough, according to Investopedia, during Bitcoin's development a decade later, Satoshi seems to have reached out to Dai before any other developer and credited him in his white paper. Eventually, Dai and all the other members of the Cypherpunk community have supported Satoshi's idea. But even though there are many similarities between the projects, Dai stated the following. My understanding is that the creator of Bitcoin didn't even read my article before reinventing the idea himself. He learned about it afterward and credited me in his paper. So my connection with the project is quite limited. Despite his statement, many people still suspect that Dai will someday be revealed as Satoshi. Also, an interesting fun fact. Just as one Bitcoin can be divided into 100 million Satoshis, one Ether, or ETH, can be divided into a billion GUE. And what is a GUE? It's a GigaWay, or one billion GUE. So GUE is the smallest unit of Ethereum in honor of Wei Dai for his contributions to cryptography. And finally, we come to Nick Szabo, another computer scientist and cryptographer, and according to some, another one of the main Satoshi suspects. His cryptocurrency idea, Bitgold, was also one of the first attempts at creating a digital currency, but same as B-Money, it was never really implemented. He first proposed it in 1998 to Cypherpunks, and only seven years later published an in-depth description of the idea. It is considered a direct predecessor to Bitcoin Protocol. And due to their similarities, people have speculated that he is indeed Satoshi Nakamoto. There were some strong evidence supporting the claim, but also some weaker ones, such as flipped initials. But we'll cover those in a future video. Despite all the evidence, Sabo denied the claim, so the mystery lives on. Back to his project. In his paper, very similar to the Bitcoin white paper and in line with the cypherpunk's vision, he kicks off with a description of the main problem with today's money, dependency on trust in a third party. He continues with precious metals, saying that they have an unforgeable scarcity due to the costliness of their creation, which provides the money with value. And if we only had something resembling gold, but in the digital realm, then we wouldn't have issues with trusted third parties and costly and inefficient storage and transfer as precious metals tend to be quite dense and therefore heavy. To solve this issue, he proposed something called secure benchmark functions, where the resulting string of bits is the proof of work and the one-way function is prohibitively difficult to compute backwards. If any of that sounds familiar, it's probably because that's how Bitcoin itself works, as the solution to each puzzle or hash becomes a part of the next puzzle and it's not feasible to calculate the hash backwards. Out of all the mentioned projects, Bitgold is the one that bears the most similarity to Bitcoin, as they have pretty much everything in common. Proof of work and minting coins, timestamping, distributed ledger or registry, and blockchain or the unforgeable chain in case of Bitgold. Also, he concludes the paper with, all money mankind has ever used has been insecure in one way or another. This insecurity has been manifested in a wide variety of ways, from counterfeiting to theft, but the most pernicious of which has probably been inflation. Bitgold may provide us with a money of unprecedented security from these dangers. This is something Bitcoin is trying to achieve as well. However, the goals of these two projects are somewhat different. Sabo envisioned that Bitcoin system is non-fungible, meaning that each coin is basically a collector's item, and that it has the role of a reserve currency to back another digital currency. 
Whereas Bitcoin are fungible, meaning that if the two of us own one BTC each and we just exchange them, it would be all the same to us. Sort of like a dollar for a dollar. Also, Zabo imagined that Bitgold mining difficulty would vary over time and that there would be fluctuations in the amounts of Bitgold that could be created. Bitcoin, on the other hand, was designed so that it gets progressively harder to mine over time. This is it for the overview of the most notable cryptocurrency projects before Bitcoin. However, this list is far from exhaustive. And before I leave you, we just have to mention a couple more people. The first is Phil Zimmerman, yet another computer scientist and cryptographer. He's the creator of PGP encryption, or Pretty Good Privacy, which is the most widely used email encryption software in the world. He originally designed it as a human rights tool and published it for free in 1991. Unfortunately, according to his website, this only made him the target of a three-year criminal investigation because, quote, the government held that US export restrictions for cryptographic software were violated when PGP spread worldwide. And despite the lack of funding, the lack of paid staff, the lack of a company to stand behind it, and despite government persecution, PGP still became what it is today. Eventually, the government dropped the case in 1996 and Phil founded PGP Incorporated. Throughout the years, Zimmerman has received numerous technical and humanitarian awards for his pioneering work in cryptography. Now, the other person probably doesn't need that much introduction at all, as he had plenty of publicity over the past 10 to 15 years, and his name is Julian Assange. Even though he's a programmer himself, his prominence in the cypherpunk movement came about somewhat differently. He is an Australian editor, publisher, and activist who founded Wikileaks in 2006. And Wikileaks is an international non-profit that publishes news leaks and classified media provided by anonymous sources. Some of the most controversial released documents were details on several US wars, such as Iraqi and Afghan war, operating procedures manual for the US prison at Guantanamo Bay, Syria files, documents detailing spying by the US National Security Agency on successive French presidents, emails and other controversial documents tied to the 2016 presidential election campaign, and many, many others. Some of the mentioned documents were published in 2010 as a part of a series of leaks provided by the US Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning, which is what brought WikiLeaks huge attention. This obviously does not sit well with the US government. So in 2010, they began investigating WikiLeaks and Assange personally to prosecute them under the Espionage Act of 1917. In August 2011, a WikiLeaks volunteer contacted the FBI and became the first FBI informant on the case. It all culminated in 2012, when Assange requested a political asylum in Ecuadorian embassy in London, where he remained until 2019, when he was arrested for failing to appear in court and he now faces extradition to the US, where he would face God knows what. He was charged to the total of 18 federal charges in the US. All of this wasn't just ignored by the press, who condemned and criticized the indictment as the violation of freedom of expression and therefore of the First Amendment. The New York Times stated, quote, Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks leader, was indicted on 17 counts of violating the Espionage Act for his role in obtaining and publishing secret military and diplomatic documents in 2010, the Justice Department announced on Thursday. A novel case that raises profound First Amendment issues. The Guardian said, quote, by bringing new charges against the WikiLeaks founder, the Trump administration has challenged the First Amendment. Edward Snowden said, quote, the DOJ just declared war, not on WikiLeaks, but on journalism itself. This is no longer about Julian Assange. This case will decide the future of media. Since WikiLeaks operates in controversial waters, after Assange's indictment, PayPal, MasterCard and Visa refused to process any more transactions for WikiLeaks on the basis of them not being able to encourage, promote or facilitate illegal activity. With all of those out of the picture, WikiLeaks turned to the only uncensorable and unconfiscatable asset for further funding, Bitcoin. And for a while there, Bitcoin and WikiLeaks became somewhat intertwined in their fight for truth, freedom and privacy, which proves Bitcoin to be a true product of the cypherpunk community. Even though Satoshi was opposing that so-called partnership as he thought the system is still too small and vulnerable. Assange stated that he made close to 50 and even 100,000% return on Bitcoin as a direct result of the US government imposed financial blockade on WikiLeaks. 
as of right now, we're still waiting to see what his verdict will be, but we can probably agree that nothing other than dropping charges would be a further violation of the First Amendment. To sum it all up, the cypherpunk movement has always been about privacy, uncensorability, unconfiscatability, and freedom of any kind. So libertarianism in short. When we take a look at what transpired with WikiLeaks, we can see that we are in dire need of a medium which won't allow the truth to be either suppressed or censored. While the cypherpunks are still fighting to secure privacy on all fields, it seems to me that we already have a hard money that satisfies all the criteria. Bitcoin is not just an investment or a get-rich-quick scheme. It's an asset over which you have complete ownership and which no one can take away from you. And that makes it the first of its kind ever in human history. Thanks for watching and see you in the next block.